Thank you. Our solid 2012 results, as already has just outlined, are gratifying, but in view of our extreme difficult market environment, these results aren't reason for us to sit back and relax. Our results are a tribute to our employees' outstanding performance, particularly in difficult times. But we were also helped by a number of positive non-recurring effects. A sober, objective assessment of our industry and our expectations requires that we take another look at the assumptions behind our 2013 forecast. During the next few years, things certainly won't be getting any easier for E.ON or, for that matter, for any other European energy supplier. Power and gas demand in our core markets still hasn't recovered from the impact of the economic and financial crisis. That's something that the entire industry is suffering from. But we operate climate-friendly gas-fired power plants that have a high degree of operational flexibility. Emission trading at the moment isn't working, and carbon allowances have become essentially worthless, and climate protection is thus no longer possible and worthless. When this will change, and when people will realize that global warming is still going on, 3.3 degrees is difficult to say. We see an improvement in our classic gas trading business where we had concerns last year. But the successful negotiations of our long-term contracts, particularly with our Norwegian and Russian suppliers, has enabled us to record markedly higher earnings here. And here, our risk mitigation strategy has paid off in a big way. Mr. Kridal and his team have successfully negotiated these contracts. Nevertheless, on balance, our traditional power and gas businesses in Europe are going through a period of consolidation. So it makes sense that we use this time to systematically establish growth opportunities inside and also outside Europe. We will continue this reorientation, and we already made a good deal of progress in 2012. The new businesses that we established, such as the power generation business in Russia um, and the development into a large market position with new energies, or ENP, are already performing very well. They were started recently and are contributing to our earnings. They don't fully offset the difficult situation in our European power generation business and in some of our regional markets, but they do represent a tangible counter-trend. The same applies to our new activities in Brazil and Turkey, where Marcus Schenk uh, was quite successful um, in preparing this last year. Uh, Energy demand in both countries is rising. Both countries want and place value in state-of-the-art generation technology, and therefore this offers us good growth opportunities. In addition, we intend to do even more to expand our distributed generation business, and we'll continue to invest heavily in renewables. So this year, we'll again we'll be laying the foundation for new and growing sources of earnings. Nevertheless, the magnitude of our current challenges makes it necessary for us to be even more decisive so that we can continue the strategic reorientation of our company in the face of lower earnings expectations. Above all, this will require, as Mr. Schenk said, strict financial discipline. We need to adjust to the fact that our current business portfolio will generate less money for new investments. As a result, we'll need to deploy our investment capital very selectively. That's why our new medium plan consists exclusively of targeted investments and particularly attractive value-enhancing growth business that will help propel our 
our company's transformation. We plan to invest just over 6 billion euros this year. Just under 4 billion euros of that will go towards completing a small number of large-scale power generation and gas storage projects that were begun in prior years and towards the ongoing expansion of renewables business and our activities outside Europe. We plan to invest about 1.5 billion in our network business and about 700 million to repair and maintain existing assets. In subsequent years, we intend to continue systematically consolidating our business, a consequence of which is that we will reduce our annual investments by nearly 2 billion. For the time being, we're systematically shelving new build projects for large-scale conventional power plants in Europe. It will remain equally important for us to continue to achieve cost reductions and efficiency improvements. Mm. We've done this uh, with the support of Mr. Reutersberg and Mr. Stachelhaus in time as part of the E.ON 2.0 program. We are already seeing the results. Cost reductions already had a significant impact. Um, we are on a good path uh, toward achieving our goal of reducing our controllable costs to 8.3 billion. This figure is adjusted for divestments. Um, by unlocking capital through successful divestments, we are ensuring that our balance sheet remains solid. By year end 2012, we already generated about 13.5 billion from the sale of non core assets. We expect to add another 3.5 billion to this by the end of the first quarter, including proceeds from the sale of Eon Energy from Waste, SPP, and Eon Thuringer Energie. This means that we've already surpassed our original target of 15 billion by a wide margin, and not just by increasing the list, but uh, thanks to the fact that our M&A team was very successful, as we said, in London. And we now expect, as a part of the divestment program, a possible target of roughly 20 billion. Uh, the disposal of Eon Westfalen, Weser, Eon Mitte, and our stake in Irenko will contribute to close this gap. This proceeds, these proceeds are reducing our debt, but enhancing our investment strengths so that we can further expand our growth business. Our organizational transformation is also making swift progress. We've gone from three holdings um, to one. Our business is now being systematically managed from Düsseldorf. This prevents duplicate work and reduces costs. In early May, our former gas trading business in Essen will be merged with our former trading unit in Düsseldorf. Right from the start, the new company will adopt a global approach and target the markets of the future. It will be more than simply the sum of Ruhrgas and trading. I'm confident that the new company will benefit in part from the outstanding international reputation, Ruhrgas has earned over decades for its expertise. Ruhrgas has helped shape the gas business not only in Germany, but also across Europe. Our energy trading business will also become more international. Following the Ruhrgas trading merger, it will support our global operations going forward. In commodity and energy trading, it's becoming increasingly important not only to track global market developments from Germany, but to seize these opportunities locally as well. One example is the United States. This year, a small team of Aeon traders based in Chicago will begin physical trading of power and gas on the U.S. commodity exchanges. In particular, we intend to systematically seize growth opportunities in liquefied natural gas. We're concerned concerned above all about the profitability of our legacy core business and conventional generation. I've pointed this out repeatedly and plainly in recent weeks. Many gas-fired power plants in Germany are threatened by closure because their fuel is relatively more expensive, clean and highly flexible. It is, and therefore it is being cre created out by wind and solar and paradoxically by coal-fired capacity. And because the EU emission trading scheme is failing completely in its role of um, promoting climate protection, yet gas-fired power plants in particular are urgently needed. So if, um, if there is no value in um, promoting cleaner generation, then there is no point in using these capacities. 
Yet gas-fired power plants in particular are urgently needed to ensure the stability of power plants in keeping commission uh, Let's look at a concrete example. Unit 5 at Irshing Power Station outside Ingolstadt was designed to operate 4,000 to 5,000 hours per year. It's currently operating less than half that, and one-third of this reduced operating time is entirely to provide network stability. And this will even increase. And we are talking about one of the most technologically advanced and most efficiency, efficient generating units in Germany. It has a fuel efficiency of nearly 60 percent. Its lack of profitability isn't just because of low operating hours, but primarily because of the margin it earns during these hours. It is much too narrow for assets like this to operate economically. For us, it's therefore clear that if the profitability of these power plants can't be restored, we'll have to shut them down. In the case of Irshing 5, we and the other co-owners will decide by the end of this month whether to shut it down. We and the other co-owners have stated this clearly and repeatedly to policymakers, regulatory agencies and the local system operator. For us, a temporary shutdown is the only economically viable solution. If our assets are needed and there is no statement at this point in time to ensure system availability, we expect fair compensation that doesn't make us any worse off or forced to accept f further losses. To put it in clear terms, when it comes to the transformation of Germany's energy system, we are not going to be a killjoy or a whipping boy. It's not right that each year Germany spends more on renewables, but that operators are left to pay the costs of power plants that may be necessary for system stability and are being forced to operate them even though they are uneconomic. We are not just talking about this one power plant, but policymakers need to have a long term policy design and uh, incentives. Also, policymakers urgently need to take action with regard to clean uh, gas-fired power plants generally. They need to develop a new market design for the power market, a design that contains fair rules for maintaining reserve capacity and long-term incentives to encourage the construction of new assets. Until this new market design is in place, we'll be even more rigorous about reducing costs and enhancing efficiency in our conventional generation business. And in some cases, we'll shut down assets. In this context, we are reviewing the profitability of individual assets with an aggregate capacity of roughly 11 gigawatts across Europe and have already decided to withdraw more than 8 gigawatts by the end of 2015, although most of these closures are due to pay plant age or environmental restrictions. I'll conclude my remarks about conventional generation by stating clearly that we won't stand idly by while our power plants continue to operate in the red. We'll either find a viable solution in collaboration with policymakers or we'll take action on our own out of our responsibility to whatever company and its shareholders. At the same time, we're significantly expanding our distributed energy business. Our approach is to draw on a variety of activities, most of which we already have, to give a broad range of our customers access to micro-generating units and smart energy technology. The next step will be to conduct centralized energy management of these units. When integrated into the overall power system, distributed generating units could play a key role in the transition to a lower carbon future. For example, we are applying our power and gas expertise to find a way to manage these units so that their surplus output no longer competes with the renewables output, but instead complements it. If we succeed, 1,001 megawatt mini-units can be just as valuable for the power supply as one big power station. With aiming of systematically expanding our distributed energy business across Europe, a few months ago we founded a new company called E.ON Connecting Energies. It focuses on serving companies in and outside Germany that have multiple energy intensive facilities and that therefore offer opportunities for delivering substantial savings through the use of custom tailored smart energy solutions. The company has already concluded a framework agreement with a large international, with a large international customer. Renewables are already a strong, well-established E.ON business of the future. We have over 4.8 gigabits of capacity, which ranks us among the top players in onshore wind in the United States and offshore wind in Europe. We specialize in very efficient project development, which has made us a world leader in asset availability and cost reduction. 
This is one of the reasons why our renewables fleet is already making significant contribution to our earnings. We will continue moving forward systematically on this path in the years ahead. We currently have about two gigawatts of renewables capacity under construction, most of which is offshore wind in Europe and onshore wind in North America. London Array, the world's largest offshore wind farm, will be inaugurated in July. After we complete this project, we'll have three others, including Amrumbank West off Germany's North Sea coast. So, uh, a good example of how we are applying our less capital, more value approach to our renewables business is the sale to a Danish pension fund of stakes in three wind farms we built just a few years ago in the United States. States. By doing so, we've unlocked within a very short time the capital we invested in these projects so that we can deploy it again to develop and build technologically advanced generation assets. This could be a paradigm for sensible partnerships between skilled technology developers and investors. Alongside our wind business in North America, our power generation business in Russia is the most developed of our operations outside Europe. Ian Russia has the most efficient assets in that country's power market. And these assets are located in regions with solid economic growth and rising energy demand. In the last couple of years, four state-of-the-art combined cycle gas turbines with an accurate capacity of 1.6 gigawatts have entered service at Chatur, Yevin and Surgat power stations. And we started another project, which will be completed in 2014. We will open a co-fire power station with 800 megawatts at Berezov power station in Krasnoyarsk. So Russia remains a strategically important market for our company. Our activities in Russia's energy market are part of our long-term corporate strategy aimed at achieving growth and further internationalization. Russia and North America are established regions in our portfolio, whilst Brazil and Turkey are newcomers. We entered both markets last year through joint ventures. Both markets continue to have some of the world's highest growth rates in energy consumption, need new generating capacity, and have made a clear political commitment to building this capacity. In beiden Märkten sind wir bewusst in bereits bestehende Portfolios eingestiegen, an deren Weiterentwicklung aber wir von Beginn an dann partizipieren können. Unser Joint Venture mit der türkischen Sabancha Holding soll bis 2020 einen Anteil von 10 Prozent am türkischen Erzeugungsmarkt erreichen. Gemeinsam mit unserem neuen Partner bereiten wir weitere Wachstumsschritte in diesen Tagen vor. Hierzu zählt der Bau eines neuen Wasserkraftwerkes mit einer Gesamtleistung von 280 Megawatt im östlichen Teil Anatoliens und die Bewerbung um die in den nächsten Tagen stattfindenden Ausschreibungen für zwei Regionalversorger. Auch bei diesen Projekten werden wir natürlich im Rahmen unserer strengen Investitionskriterien bieten. Und auch unser Joint Venture mit MPX in Brasilien kommt gut voran und entwickelt Kraftwerksprojekte, die ab der zweiten Hälfte des Jahrzehnts zunehmenden Ergebnisbeiträge liefern sollen. Das erste gemeinsame Projekt soll noch im Herbst dieses Jahres ans Netz gehen. Das junge Geschäftsfeld E&P entwickelt sich ebenfalls sehr gut. Im Februar hat das Öl- und Gasfeld Heim im norwegischen Nordmeer die Produktion aufgenommen. Und Ende März wird das vor wenigen Jahren entdeckte Huntingtonfeld in der britischen Nordsee planmäßig die Produktion aufnehmen. E.ON hält daran einen Anteil von 25 Prozent und ist sogar der Betreiber. Der Start der Gas- und Ölproduktion für die modernste Technik and ist also the ein Meilenstein für das internationale E.ON E.ON-P-Geschäft. The start of gas and oil production at Huntington, which involves state-of-the-art technology, represents another milestone in E.ON's international E.N.P. business. The journalists among you who have covered our company for a long time will remember that the power business is cyclical and hasn't always been profitable in recent decades. You might remember that in 21, in the wake of liberalization, power prices dropped even further than they have recently. Then, as now, E.ON meets difficult market conditions head-on. 
And as was the case back then, earnings shortfalls resulting from market changes and dislocations can't be offset overnight. But we've laid the necessary groundwork in important ways. In Europe, we are focusing on businesses like networks and retail sales that will generate sufficient returns into the future. We'll continue to divest non-core businesses. We're addressing the difficult situation in the generation business in Europe by resolutely making the profitability of every asset the basis of our actions. If an asset isn't profitable and can't be made profitable in the near term, we'll shut it down. It goes without saying that in the future we'll continue to be a big energy producer. But the significance of our conventional generation business in Europe for group earnings will decline at roughly the rate at which the contribution from our growth businesses increases. As we further consolidate our business in Europe, we're systematically seizing growth opportunities outside Europe, Russia and North America are already success stories that we intend to continue. Now they are joined by Brazil and Turkey. Renewables, ENP and distributed energy are our growth businesses and will play an increasingly significant role at E.ON. Although our transformation is still underway, the contours of the new E.ON are already becoming clear. We are becoming leaner, faster, more international and more decentralized. With this new orientation, we will use the next few difficult years for a fundamental transformation of our company so that we can deliver new robust growth in the second half of the decade. And I would now like to give you some HR news. As you read in our press release, as it's at its regularly scheduled meeting yesterday, the supervisory board confirmed by mutual agreement and unanimous vote recommendations for appointments to the E.ON Board of Management made by the supervisory board chairman. Prior to this, my colleague Regine Stachelhaus had informed the supervisory board chairman that she would like to end her service on the board of management effective July 1, 2013, owing to severe illness in her immediate family. She wants to take out more time for her family because she can't take uh, the dual burden caring for her family and assuming the board responsibilities. The supervisory board, which fully understands and respects Mrs. Stachelhaus' situation, granted her wish. On behalf of the E.ON Board of Management, I'd like to underscore Mrs. Stachelhaus' very considerable achievements over the past nearly three years, especially in her role as Chief Human Resources Officer. In particular, it was thanks to her great personal dedication that a consensus was reached with trade unions and employee representatives on socially responsible solutions for implementing the E.ON Zero efficiency program. In recent weeks, she also succeeded in working out a mutually acceptable compromise wage agreement with trade unions in Germany for 2013. This averted at the last minute a labor dispute. She also made important progress in establishing shared services, which are core components of our efficiency program. She oversaw the outsourcing of standard IT processes, the creation of centralized procurement and HR organizations and the establishment of specialized shared services entities for both HR and accounting. On behalf of all E.ON Board of Management members, I'd like to thank Mrs. Stachelhaus for her enormous and successful efforts and for her outstanding teamwork on the board. At the same time, I'm very pleased that we'll still benefit from Mrs. Stachelhaus' expertise, even after her service on the Board of Management ends. To the degree ti her time permits, she'll continue to play a leadership role on several issues at our company, including corporate responsibility, particularly with regard to sustainability issues involving our group white apprenticeship and employee training programs. In addition, Mrs. Stachelhaus will continue to hold a number of directors on E.ON's behalf. These include representing our interests on the ESMT Supervisory Board. And it's important to me that Mrs. Stachelhaus has also agreed to continue to be involved in diversity issues and the integration of female executives at our company. Despite all our efforts, we haven't yet reached our ambitious objective of uh, having more female executives, and therefore we can still use her support in this area. Klaus Dieter Maubach will also enter service on the Board of Management at the end of this month. This decision was made by mutual agreement, and for the last three years, Mr. Maubach has been a driving force in promoting innovative energy ideas across our company. His achievements range from the e-mobility initiative with the federal government and the German industry to his role in the further build-up 
of the Eon Energy Research Center at the Rhein University in Aachen. Mr. Maubach also oversaw the design of our business model for distributed generation, and, uh, which we've already implemented by establishing our new subsidiary, Eon Connecting Energies, which I mentioned a few moments ago. Mr. Maubach would now like to take on new professional challenges, and I would like to thank him for this dedication and wish him all the best for the future on behalf of the management board. I'm very pleased that new, two new outstanding individuals, Leonard Birnbaum and Mike Winkel, will be joining the Eon Board of Management. Leonard Birnbaum is probably very familiar to most of the people here today from his pre previous role on the RWE Board of Management and as a recognized expert in the German and international energy industry. His career has given him an extremely broad range of experience, which he'll be able to draw on as he oversees a newly created Board of Management portfolio called Markets and Services. It will encompass, among other things, EON Connecting Energy's distributed energy business and the coordination of EON's new build activities. Mr. Birnbaum will also be responsible for overseeing the development of new business ideas and EON's energy industry positioning. I'm convinced he'll be an outstanding addition to the E.N. Board of Management, and the same can be said about Mike Winkel, who has already been part of the E.N. Group for 16 years. Well, you can continue taking your photographs later. After serving on the E.N. Russia Board of Management, most recently, and he has stayed in Moscow for a couple of years and at several uh, generation sites. So after serving this last position, most recently he has been extremely successful overseeing the further expansion of our renewables business and make it into a global leader. In view of this experience, it makes sense that Mr. Wink in addition to his role as new chief Re human resources officer, will also be responsible for the group's conventional and renewables businesses. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to both new colleagues, also on behalf of all other colleagues, and I'm looking forward to successful teamwork with them on the board. Naturally, I'm also pleased that the supervisory board expressed its confidence in three board of management members whose appointments were up for extension. The appointment of Jürgen Kildal and my own appointment as chairman of the Board of Management were extended for another five years uh, until year end 2018, the standard term for extension in view of our ages. It won't surprise you that I'll remain CEO. Mr. Kilda's future portfolio will include E.ON exploration and production all growth businesses outside Europe, including E.ON's business in Russia. Bernhard Reutersberg's service agreement was also extended. In accordance with long-standing E.ON practice, the extension initially runs until the end of his 62nd year. Mr. Reutersberg just had a birthday a few days ago, so this will be in 2016. Thereafter, further extensions are possible in according with our long-standing E.ON practice. Mr. Reutersberg will continue to direct E.ON's regional businesses in Europe, which consists of distribution and sales, and it will also he will also retain overall responsibility of the E.ON 2.0 program. For the sake of clarity, I make it clear that uh, Markus Schenk's service agreement wasn't up for extension yesterday because his current appointment runs through year-end 2014. Therefore, it can't be extended now. As such, under German corporate law, there was no reason for this matter to be on the supervisory board's agenda, and he will remain CFO and will be additionally responsible for shared services, finance and IT. And I would now like to 